and we're back. Welcome to No Direction, the Pathfinder News, Reviews, and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. It's been a couple of weeks since PaizoCon, and we are still only slowly digesting the biggest news that Paizo's dropped pretty much in the company's history. For the first time ever, they are going to be publishing a second role-playing game, complete with some support. We've heard about Adventure Paths. That's about as much as we know concrete for sure. So to get some more of those details, we have Paizo's creative director and the lead on Starfinder joining us today, Mr. James L. Sutter. Hey, everybody. Hey. Welcome back to the show, James. Hey, thanks for having me back. It's been too long. For sure. Okay, so let's start with the obvious question. Starfinder. Holy crap! Why? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, holy crap, isn't really a question, but it's the right sentiment. The, the why um, is at the end of there. In terms of why, I mean, the real answer is why not? Um, because, you know, I mean, science fiction has been something that everybody, you know, science fiction and fantasy go together. Everybody here that yeah. loves fantasy loves science fiction. And so, you know, we've gotten to do a fantasy game for, God, what, eight years now? Seven? Something like that. Um, maybe even more. Uh, and, you know, since the very beginning, we've always, you know, certainly I've been dropping little science fiction-y hints in there. And, you know, the success of things like Iron Gods have shown that the audience is into it. You know, people around here, the office are into it. And so there, for a long time, there'd been this idea of, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a science fantasy version of Pathfinder? Um, but something that was that was its own thing, you know, there were thoughts of, well, maybe it'll be a science fiction adventures hardcover, kind of like uh, like horror adventures or something like that, where we're just putting a skin on Pathfinder or telling people how to run different games. Um, but in the end, Eric was like, no, you know what? Let's do this for real. Let's go ahead and make the Starfinder role-playing game, which, th I mean, that name had been kicking around for a long time. And ever since Eric first said it, we all went... Yes, that is, that is the thing that would be the natural thing to do. Um, and it just finally was time. Um, and so I'm really excited about it. I know we've got a bunch of people around here working on it in various different capacities. Um, so as you said, I'm the, uh, I'm the creative director on Starfinder. We've also got uh, Rob McCreary and Owen Stevens are sort of the lead developers on it with me. Um, they're going to be working on both the core rule book and the adventure path that accompanies it. Um, but we've also got the rules design team is on it. All the developers and editors are contributing. You know, the art team, obviously Sarah Robinson is heading the look for everything. Uh, but there's nobody in the company who isn't going to be touching this project. Um, so it's, it's fun. It's still very early days, so I'll warn people in advance that there's a lot of stuff I can't tell you because I'm not supposed to, and even more stuff I can't tell you because I don't know yet. But uh, but we really wanted to just sort of get the announcement out there while, well, you know, we're all very excited about it. We knew PaizoCon had to be the right time to do it because that's where our fans are most concentrated, and we just knew it would be the most fun to announce it there rather than we could have waited till December or something when we knew more about the game, but then we wouldn't have been able to have that moment of sharing it with everybody. And I'll tell you, from the beginning of the project, I've been, I had been thinking about that moment in the, the banquet announcement at PaizoCon where we just say, hey, guess what? You know, you wanted a Distant Worlds adventure path. How about a Distant Worlds game? Um, and just kind of do that mic drop. So that was really gratifying to see people's reaction to that. And was there much fear that after the mic drop, it would just be crickets? Oh my God, yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I've been, I was scared of it. I mean, I think we had a sense that people were going to be into it, if only because anytime a bunch of people around here get excited about a thing, there's at least a decent chance that a portion of the audience will share that excitement. But I think we were all kind of blown away by how many people were really, really on board, even just from the first first announcement. I, yeah, I had people coming up to me you know, there was there was somebody who was like close to tears, like, "Oh my God, finally!" You know, um, and so it was, it was actually a more enthusiastic reaction than we were expecting. But you know, obviously, we're we're thrilled about it. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll have to see what happens. I mean, it's it's early days yet. I know right now everybody's excited because we've literally promised the moon, 
and that's all anybody <laughs> and that's all anybody knows Wait, yet. So I'm sure. So you're confirming the moon is still there. <laughs> Actually, the moon is not. So see, there's there's one of those things that probably going back on promises. Man, already. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be tarred and feathered, but that's why <laughs> that's why I'm out here. They're putting me in front to take all the arrows. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to the core team of you, Owen, and Rob? Um. Yeah. I mean, so there's. You know, part of it is just who's the most excited about it. Part of it is who's available, who's working on other projects. Because obviously, Pathfinder is still going full steam. You know, we're still doing all the adventure paths, campaign setting. You know, everything we've been producing for Pathfinder is still continuing forward. We're just now adding on this whole new, I mean, product line. But really, it's got several product lines underneath it. Um, but, I mean, I think... Honestly, as for why I'm the creative director on it, I think it's a combination of this is maybe my 12th year at Paizo, so I've been wow. around for a long time. I, I know, right? Like, um, So a combination of seniority, and I think everybody also knows that I'm kind of the, the space nerd. Um, you know, I since... I've often told the story, but way back in uh, Pathfinder 3, when I was writing up the Gazetteer of Verissia, um, Jacobs and Wes had to talk me down from putting a space elevator in that one. <laughs> um, I think it was the Spire of Lemris was originally a, just a straight-up space elevator. And, you know, I've been, I've been dropping, you know, stuff like that, ways to get to the other planets for years. And then, of course, Distant Worlds was our exploration of the campaign setting, uh, or the solar system for the campaign setting. And I wrote that, so I seemed, I guess, like a natural to be heading the sort of the setting part, and then that turned into, well, why don't you just manage the whole brand and project? Um, but at the same time, like, I'm certainly not the only one who's interested in this stuff. You know, Rob was into it, you know, from the beginning, and he's very much... Uh, you know, James Jacobs and him have been running the adventure paths forever. So if we're now going to have two different adventure path lines, well, Rob should run one of those. Um, and so he took on Starfinder. Owen has a wealth of experience. I mean, he worked on D20 Modern and Star Wars. And so he, he's he got more hands-on experience with things like laser guns than anybody around here. Um, and then after that, a lot of it really is about who's the most excited you know who wants to play with uh starships and you know space aliens uh and those are the people we're trying to get uh involved in the project but like i said it's kind of everybody now you have talked about how there's a lot there's already been a lot of science fiction elements in the pathfinder campaign setting so was it the decision right from the beginning of starfinder that it would be set in the same uh, galaxy same universe I mean, uh, sort of. Um, that was the original pitch, um, which was then, of course, hotly contested because nothing we do in the Paizo office ever is uh, is the first draft going, going to print. You know, there's always a conflicting opinion and you know, different people trying to play around with different ideas. So we explored a lot of different options, but in the end, we just felt like the idea of going into a possible future of Galarian's setting was just so compelling. We want to see those Easter eggs of things that have carried forward, you know, how things have changed. Like, we, there was a thought of we could do a brand new setting, you know, have it be totally unrelated, but then would it really be Starfinder or would it just be a totally different game? Like, this, the rules and the setting are both integrally tied to Pathfinder. It just also stands alone. Yeah, there were two moments during both the... Um the announcement at the banquet and then the Starfinder seminar where it really clicked that this is like the, where the finder part of Starfinder really clicked with me. And one of them was that the gods, like you talked a lot about the gods and how they were involved. And when I think sci-fi settings, I don't think of the gods being as heavily involved as in a, a fantasy setting. So what's the thinking there and exactly how can we expect the gods to influence the setting? Well, that was, like you say, you don't really see the gods as much in science fiction, which is part of what really helps color this as science fantasy. We want this to be that bridge. You know, this is not a Star Trek role-playing game. Like, this is still, uh, you know, originally, very early on, I had dropped the line, space wizards and laser ninjas. You know, um, like and, <laughs> you know, those, those are not class names, but... Um, uh, 
basic idea is we want this to still be a setting where there is magic, where people are blending these two things. So it's not just one or the other, Um, because I think it lends to more interesting stories. Um, And in terms of how the gods are involved, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the gods and the planes. Um, They will still absolutely be involved, but they're definitely going to be pulled back some. You're not going to need... the gods are going to be a bit more mysterious. You'll definitely see some familiar faces and some new ones, but it's not going to be uh, as easy to just ask your god what they think about things and get a direct answer. It's more, um, as as is true of a lot of more, like you say, science fictional games, there's a little bit more personal interpretation involved with belief in uh, the Starfinder setting. The other moment that really clicked with me was finding out that Glarin would be gone and that Absalom Station would kind of be the home base, like it would be the new inner sea region for this campaign setting. And the comparison I made, and I may have even made it last episode, was that um, I like the Star Wars uh, legacy comics, but the more we read about the future of Star Wars, the less impact what Luke Skywalker did has. So by taking Glarian out of it, it feels like what I'm doing in Pathfinder still matters, because we don't know how that stuff got resolved in the future. Exactly. And that was one of the big things, um, is one of the main reasons for the gap. And people have conflicting feelings on this. But we don't want this just to be the game about finding out what happened in 4719 on Galarian. You know, that's not what this game is about. And actually, you know, the gap itself, I was just talking about this with Eric Mona, the publisher, the other day. Um... You know, the the gap, everybody's quite focused on that right now because people don't know much yet about Starfinder itself. So the focus is kind of on the period between Pathfinder and Starfinder. But I actually think the game of Starfinder itself is going to be much more focused on going out and exploring new worlds. You know, it's it's outward facing rather than being about the history of Pathfinder or the legacy. Like, those are things that flavor it, but it's not... You know, you can play a game where you're all about trying to figure out what the gap was or trying to find Galarian or whatever, but that's not really the heart of the setting. The heart of the setting is, hey, you have faster than light travel, you know, for the for kind of the first time, and there's a whole galaxy of worlds out there waiting for you to go explore them. Go forth. That's really going to be the thrust of the game, um, both to capture that spirit of exploration for the players, and also because I think that actually designing settings and designing fun worlds is one of the most fun things a game master can do. So there's going to be a lot more emphasis on that sort of terra incognita in Starfinder um, as, as a game that the GM can kind of play. Like, not necessarily rules-wise, but just that's what game mastering is it's creating worlds and telling stories within them now a few years back uh, probably the very first no it was probably the second or first or second uh, year and beyond seminar uh, the question was brought up whether or not you all would do another role playing game and the future role playing game was brought up and one of the things that Lisa Stevens at the time said was that you would not do another role playing game unless you could do it right like with the equivalent of how you did Pathfinder and as supported. Now, is that still a true statement? Uh, yes. I mean, the question of as supported is a little bit uh, weird because I think the the answer is really how, doing it so that the game has as much support as it needs, right? Because uh, in terms of the number of products we'll be releasing, Starfinder is going to have a lot fewer products associated with it than Pathfinder. You know, Pathfinder, we've got the, you know, companion campaign setting stuff, we've got the adventure path, we've got the hardcovers, we've got all of this content coming out all the time. The idea with Starfinder is to really slim that down. You know, so maybe every, you know, you're going to get the core rule book, and then, you know, maybe you get another hardcover every year or whatever. Um, You know, because of course, you know, I I can't say we're doing a monster book, but we'd have to be pretty crazy to not be doing a monster book, right? Um, and so, but beyond that, we really want the adventure path to be the primary vector by which you get new information, not just about the setting, but also about the rules. So really, it'll be, in a lot of ways, kind of like the early days of Pathfinder, where most of what you learned about the setting, 
was coming through those back matter articles in Pathfinder. Um, and we want to try and do that with Starfinder to really concentrate down the information that people are getting about the world, about the game, all of these things, and making that Pathfinder adventure path, or <laughs> I'm so used to saying Pathfinder, the Starfinder adventure path, the book that you need to subscribe to to get all of the information. Um, so that if you want adventures, it's there. If you want new rules for power armor, it's there. If you want a uh, gazetteer of Castravel or some new planet, it's there. Um, so you kind of don't have to pick and choose. You can just subscribe to one thing and be totally up, like up to date on all the information that we've put out. I think that's, that's a thing that people have certainly asked for. And well, I think with Pathfinder, it's been a really good idea to put a, a ton of information out there because it's fun, people like it, but I think there's also an element of um, something kind of beautiful of having just a small amount every, uh, every month. Now, I want to talk about the logistics of that book and like uh, printed support, but we've got a, a lot of questions coming in from chat, and I don't sure. want them to feel neglected. And we'll start with one that I'm sure you've got a canned answer for by now, but uh, Claw of Orm <laughs> was the first person to ask it. Uh, Starfinder Society. Okay, so this is one that I actually don't have a canned answer for, so oh, okay. bear with me. Um, we would all love to see Starfinder organized play. That said, I am confident that if we just announced such a thing, um, everyone in that office behind me would immediately catch on fire. Like, those, <laughs> those guys are so incredibly busy making Pathfinder Society run that there's just simply no way we could ask them to do, oh, can you do twice your job? Like, not possible. So we all, at the same time, acknowledge that organized play, an organized play element to Starfinder, would be huge and really necessary for the, the vitality of the community in the game. So figuring out how to square that circle is something that the, you know, the Pathfinder Society folks and Eric and I are all still trying to figure out. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is, there truly is no answer yet, but we're very aware that people want that, and frankly, that we want that. So when you do announce it, you're saying that we need to ship you graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I will not, and this is where I'll you know, sort of echo Lisa, like, I don't think, that we're absolutely not going to announce anything org play related until we've figured out a way to do it that is safe and sane. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the few things that worried me and Ryan. I mean, this is one of the few, this is really worries us, you know, as fans and, and media that covers this show, thing, is the logistics of taking on a second game has to be intimidating. I mean, not just the game itself and the organized play and putting out the monthly book, but let's face it, you guys have slipped deadlines a lot before with just one game. I mean, you know, it's it's no big deal. I wasn't really doing anything anyway. <laughs> it, no, it turns out it is actually a tremendous amount of work to make these games go. Um, and so we've, you know, been very carefully scheduling everything to make sure that we can do it without endangering, uh, you know, other products. You know, we, we staff up when we have to staff up. We pull every trick we can. Um, I won't lie and say it's going to be easy. Um, certainly, I don't sleep as much as I used to. But sometimes, when a project is this awesome, you just you just gotta say, you know, I think I think we can do that, and then build that, you know, build that structure to make it happen. Um, so yeah, that that said, you know, it, <laughs> I guess there's no real uh, honest way to say anything except that like we can totally do it, and we're going to. It will also be very hard. I don't want to lie and say that it won't be very hard. But on the plus side, this is something that I think people are really passionate about. I mean, the and that, that helps. I mean, this is something new and awesome that's uh, different from anything we've done before. So, you know, uh, if nothing else, the enthusiasm helps. A few more questions from chat. Louise sure. Loza says, will the Starfinder Adventure Path launch alongside the rulebook? Yes. They're both going to hit at that Gen Con. Mm -hmm. And Jay that's Franklin. Gen Con 2017. Mm -hmm. Jay Franklin wants a Laser Ninja Prestige class. 
<laughs> he doesn't need it right off the bat, but by about level seven, <laughs> he expects laser ninjas. Fair enough. I think uh, I think we've got, although not necessarily by that name yet, I think we've got you covered. Okay, great. Is it just the ROM class? <laughs> I mean, everything... I'm gonna I'm going to defer on most rules related questions at this point because it would be way too early to start making promises. But uh, well, that, I mean I've oh, sorry go for it. That brings up a question. Um, the, the three of you are, are working on this. So how are you guys dividing your roles? Like what are you most doing? What is Owen most doing? Well, it's actually not. I mean, like I was saying, it's not just the three of us. We're the we're the three that are sort of like the mm-hmm. ones hitched to the cart in the very long term. But in the short term, a lot of different people are pulling. Like right now, we're doing a lot of work with Jason and Stephen and Logan and Mark uh, Mark Seifter, um on the rule stuff, getting the classes hammered out, getting all of the you know how do skills change how does starship combat work you know all of these very crunchy mechanical pieces um so we're doing that but then at the same time you know uh rob and owen and i and eric and various other people that we pull in uh have been working a lot on the setting issues you know what are the what are the major threats in the system what are the factions what are what are the planets like? I mean, this is set in Galarian's solar system, so it's, you know, it's the same worlds from distant worlds. You know, you've got Versace and Eox and all of these, but it's been an unknown number of, of years. You know, it's been thousands of years since then. How have things changed? So we've been having long conversations about that. Um, so really, we've got sort of the same people often being divided into different task forces based on simply who's best suited to the job but uh really when you get right down to it for the three of us um in sort of the long term i'm kind of the overarching brand guy you know create creative director is all about that sort of holding the vision but knowing how to not uh not get really tied up in your own uh your own ideas you know there's a lot of uh, knowing who to hand stuff off to and when to hand stuff off, which is a lot of the time. And uh, frankly, like, you know, br- bring your ideas and then let people do other things with them and know how to listen to people. Um, so that my my role is really as that sort of coordinator. Um, Rob is of course going to be helming the adventure path, and Owen has massive rules chops, so he's going to be doing a lot of the mechanical stuff. But like I said, we're all we're all up in each other's business, you know. <laughs> Owen's doing setting stuff. Well, I'm giving Rob advice on Adventure Path. He's talking about rules. Like we're all everywhere. So we have had a more active chat yeah, than we've they, had for most episodes. So I'm trying to manage a lot of things right now. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll I'll admit that I haven't fully been paying attention, James. So if I ask a question it's, you've already answered, feel free to tell me I should have paid attention. Yeah, man, Here. it's it is just fine. I've been running kind of ragged, <laughs> getting all this all stuff right. figured out anyway. Uh, Jay Franklin three thousand wants to know where are you putting the Shrike? The Shrike. Oh man, so that's of course a reference to Dan Simmons' Hyperion books, which as anybody who's been hanging around the message boards for a long time probably knows, um, Dan Simmons' Hyperion series is a seminal work for both me and James Jacobs. It was sort of one of the first things we bonded over. And the Shrike is the monster that uh, that is sort of the focus of that series. Um, so we are not ripping off the Shrike itself. There are definitely elements that uh, people familiar with that series will recognize, uh, frankly, because there are already some homages in Distant Worlds. <laughs> um, but hopefully it won't be too obvious. Well, that brings up a good point is um the pathfinder's always had a pulpy influence and i imagine yeah. starfinder's going to have a pulpy influence too so what are the influences and major sources that you're drawing from oh my god i mean we've got we've got a whole bunch which is actually one of the advantages of having a whole team rather than just you know one or two people um so there's you know of course, on the game side of things, you know, there's people who are like, oh my god, I love Spelljammer. Well, I love, you know, uh, I love um, Shadowrun, you know, or Warhammer 40k, you know, stuff like that. Um, then, of course, on the on the fiction side, um, you know, Hyperion is a big one. I think Star Wars is actually a huge one. Like, when you ask about the blend of science fiction and fantasy, Star Wars is a little more science fiction, but, like, 
the Jedi are wizards. So that's already a science fantasy setting. And more importantly, that setting has, uh, has a lot of sort of the, the color and flavor of when you walk into the Moss Eisley Cantina and you see all those different aliens. That's something that to me is really important to have in a science fiction setting or a science fantasy setting. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, I think in terms of newer stuff, actually, The Expanse, have you guys been reading Je- James S.A. Corey's series or watching the um the series i honestly on. only read pathfinder tales novels i um, unless you're saying that <laughs> everybody listen to this man i've been watching <laughs> i've been watching the tv show but the uh, the sci-fi book that right now that has got me right now is lost fleet oh i don't know that one but uh but yeah but so um james s a Corey's expanse series is one that i know uh rob and i are super excited about right now um but i mean the, Really, there's all sorts of stuff from the Pulp Era Sword and Planet stuff that uh, that you know Eric is especially the biggest expert on. I mean, there's a lot on Akaton that from the very beginning has been inspired not just by John Carter and whatnot, but really by Lee Brackett. Uh, her early Mars stuff was really had that sort of gritty trench city kind of vibe to it. Um, and she, of course, was the woman who wrote the original draft of The Empire Strikes Back. Um, she was sort of a, a noir author as well as a uh, science fiction fantasy person. Um, but yeah, so we're really we're pulling influences from all the way back to the 30s to stuff that's coming out right now. Mm-hmm. And if you take uh, the, the lightsabers out of Empire, it could easily have been a 1920s noir novel. Well, exactly, right? Like, you start to see stuff in, like, you know, if you go back and read Lee Brackett's uh, uh, Mars books, you'll see, like, Han Solo was right there. Um, Eric John Stark is really kind of uh, a precursor for that. So it's it's fascinating to look at the history, but I'll also admit that I tend to read uh, a lot of the newer stuff as well. Like, stuff like The Expanse or, like... Uh, I don't know. I mean, China Mieville's Embassy Town is a fascinating science fiction book that's really all about the cultural exchange uh, between uh, races making kind of first contact. All right. I was going to go into some questions from chat, but you brought up races. And I know that you've got very strong feelings about how different races should be portrayed, especially when it comes to alignment. So when it comes to uh, exploring the different alien races that will be in the solar system, how are they going to be differentiated from human? How much will that be like ingrained in their personalities versus tendencies? I mean, just if we're asking how different are they, uh, I mean, I would say I would like them to be more different than the races in Star Trek, but still relatable. Um, you know, because it fundamentally, now that's, we're talking about the core races here. I also want there to be crazy aliens everywhere, you know, aliens that you can't even begin to comprehend, that uh, language is difficult. You know, I think I would love to see a game where even even down the road, I think if we can make it so that you can play uh, one of the Brethidens, the floating, you know, jellyfish-like uh, sort of cell creatures, or or one of the contemplatives of a shock uh, on Akaton, which are basically like giant floating brains with little sort of fetal bodies dangling beneath them. Mm-hmm. I would love to have those be player characters, but in the beginning, we're going to be giving people stuff that's much more humanoid and relatable um, as the core races, just because it's easier for people to get into that. If I say you're just a sentient ball of light floating around it's really hard to then take levels in a martial class right you know um i i want people to be able to make characters that feel different but can still work together in a party setting because this is still all about adventuring groups you also mentioned languages now. Is it going to be more of a universal translator? Everyone gets the gist of everyone else, or will there be real language barriers? Well, that's something we're actually still deciding. I mean, I've certainly got some feelings on it, um, but it's always it's always a hard nut to crack because on the one hand, you want there to be some barriers to understanding, and you want, frankly, somebody to have a reason to learn a language, but at the same time, when you've got this many cultures interacting, like the thing about a spacefaring society is that if every planet has a different language and you're going to dozens of different planets, you don't want to have, have a constant language barrier everywhere you go. So 
we're gonna have to figure out how to how to square that circle. Yeah. So as a, an Anglo Quebecer. I do know what it's like to be a language minority, and like looking at Pathfinder, it's like this. I, this is not how language works at all. Thank goodness for that, because yeah. <laughs> this is a game, and I don't want to have to figure out what everyone is saying all the well, time. Ex exactly. In fact, uh, Rob and I were both. Um, I'm going to use the term discussing rather than arguing, <laughs> but like we were just uh, going on about this a couple of days ago, um, and and you know often what'll happen when we're having some disagreement. Uh, you know, where I'll say, oh, I think it should be one way, and somebody else will say, oh, well, I really think it should be the other way. Oftentimes, my answer is just like, okay, show me. Like, do, you know, I am willing to give you uh, the benefit of the doubt, just show me how it works. Um, and people come back with great stuff. Like, I, I, I think one of the reasons, honestly, I got uh, picked to be the creative director on this is because I don't think I'm, you know, God's gift to game design by any means. Like not that not that anyone else here does, but like I think it's really useful to have whoever is in charge of assigning the stuff know that they don't know what they're doing. Um and man, <laughs> do I have that in spades. So <laughs> um so yeah, so uh, it's been it's been interesting figuring out all the different uh ways we can work this stuff. A couple of other questions from chat. Uh Esclinge? I believe is asking any chance you'll spoil the name of the AI god. Oh no! Um, <laughs> oh, great answer. Yeah. Uh, no, and that's partially because we have gone through several names for that god in like the last two days. Just a series of zeros and ones. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's just, it's just binary all the time. Um, <laughs> but but no, actually, that's that's one that we've really been uh, tumbling over a lot, just because. It's got to be. It's got to be just right. It's a god that several of us are really pretty excited about, and so uh, we want to make sure that it get, captures the right flavor. Well, that actually leads into Bobson's question from chat. Uh, he says there is an official answer for the mystery of Aridan's death, even if it's never going to be revealed. A few people at Paza know it. Is this the tr same going to be true about the gap? Yes, actually. We uh, that was something where from the very beginning we were like, hey. We are never going to say these things. Let's sit down and make sure that everybody in this room understands what happened, why it happened, like the possible implications. Um, now let's go forth and never say that out loud, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's important, especially in a game where people are going to be trying to find these answers sometimes. Like there's certainly going to be Pathfinder characters that are really interested in unraveling and I said Pathfinder again, Starfinder characters <laughs> that are going to be really interested in figuring out how this works. And we don't want any clues we drop to be disjointed. We want them all to be pointed the same direction. We just don't want you to figure it out. Yeah, that is the perfect answer for that question because it would be so frustrating if somehow it did end up going out there and it was clear you just made it up on the spot and years of hints were just red herrings or... Yeah, nobody yeah. wants then, the lost ending. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's exactly what we I were was all thinking. thinking. It, yeah. <laughs> no offense to the lost writers. I know lots how hard of that can be. Lots of offense. <laughs> uh, no hard. The shark has a question that will then lead into a much larger section of questions for us. Will the setting material in the core rulebook be integrated into the rules, or will it be a separate entity? Um. Well, let's see. Um. Kind of both. Like, there's definitely... It definitely will not be a firm separation. Um, you know, there's... I can already think of one class in particular that is going to be pretty pretty crucially tied into setting stuff. Um, but that said, uh, it certainly won't be a question of do you need every... Uh, like, do you need to understand the setting to understand the rules behind the system? And the and the answer is like, no. You definitely won't need to read any of the setting stuff to understand the the system. That said, we won't be trying as hard to keep the two separate as we have in Pathfinder. Now I'm trying to picture this book. You've got the core rulebook for the role playing game for Pathfinder role playing game is the largest book you've ever published. <laughs> Yep. The campaign setting for Pathfinder, still a sizable book. Mm -hmm. So you want one book that covers all this material, 
plus space exploration, plus a much larger surface area, mm -hmm. uh, uh, galaxies beyond the galaxies we know, and you're going to put this in one book. I mean, is this going yeah, to be and, so... And, and we'd love for it to have more art than the core rule book does, too. Like, to be more art-heavy and have more, more design. So, yeah, no, you're right. This is like uh, when we sat down and said, okay, what do we need to be in this book? We did the math, and it was like, it's like an 800-page book. <laughs> we are so screwed. Um, and then, so then, you know, my, my first job and my continuing job has been figuring out, okay, how can we condense? How can we slim? How can we make this thing give us all of the best parts that we need and yet still fit into a book that is that is capable of being bound by <laughs> by mortal printers right uh and it's it's tough squeezing it all down but i think that the end result will actually be uh a really a really pretty awesome product because it's going to be heavily uh boiled down to sort of just the best parts um, I think that in some ways the game, and people should be prepared for this, um, I think that the game will be, uh, how to say this, we're trying to make it a little more streamlined while also still having the same strategic robustness of Pathfinder. So, you know, will there be as many spells in the Starfinder core rulebook as are in the Pathfinder core rulebook? Probably not, but will you have all the ones that are fun to play with that you that you need on a you know regular basis? Like, yeah, that's that's the goal to give you everything you need to make it a little bit easier to make some choices and to like you know if you're if you're a new player getting dropped in there, I want it to be easier to figure out what feat to take. But at the same time, I also want the player who's been playing for years to have a bevy of options so that they can make a truly different character no matter how many characters they end up making over the life of their, you know, of their game. So it's going to be it's going to be a little bit more streamlined than the current one, but the hope is that the flavor will be so strong and the fun factor will be so strong that it'll be just as good or better. And one thing I'm not clear on, will will you need the Pathfinder core rulebook? To play Starfinder. No. Okay. No, this is a fully standalone game. All you'll need to play Starfinder is the Starfinder core rulebook. So it'll and is that tell what you call it, Go ahead. I mean that's that's what we're calling it right now. Um I would be sort of shocked if that name changed, but anything could happen. Um Yeah, I, I refuse to be bound by anything I say at this point. <laughs> oh, um, we're gonna have to make that the episode quote. Yeah, disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer. Um but yeah, uh, and that is still the whole idea is like, hey, this book is what you need to play. You can sit down with this and, you know, maybe pick up the first adventure path right, you know, on day one so that you've got an adventure and, you know, the rules ready to go. But yeah, this is all you need. Now, with the, we've had years to understand the different types of games and play styles that we can do in fantasy. So picking up Pathfinder wasn't all that difficult. But with Starfinder, the setting's so unique. How, what kind of play styles, what kind of game types are you trying to support out the gate? Well, I mean, in a lot of ways, if you know how to play Pathfinder and if you're familiar with playing Pathfinder, Starfinder will feel similar. Mm -hmm. And you'll honestly know most of the rules already um you know we're we're still going to have characters that take classes and you'll still have your attributes and you know, there's still skills and feats and spells you know it's not that different it's just been changed to make it fit better with a science fantasy uh setting you know we've we've tweaked the framework but a, you know the car is still a car um in terms of play styles i think that it's really going to be Pretty, pretty similar, actually. You know, there's going to be a large focus on exploration. Um, I think there will still be there will still be dungeon delves, essentially, but now it'll be going into alien ruins and whatnot. I think there will be more social stuff. There will be more technology stuff. Um, but I mean, when you get right down to it, it's going to be a very similar game. You're going to have your people that want to role play, and the and your people that are hardcore you know, min-maxed martial characters. Um, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, there'll be people that are really into the starship setting or people, you know, it's going to be very, uh, it'll still be tactical. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's going to probably have more of a focus on ranged combat than melee combat because in the future there's a whole lot of guns around but there will still be people running around with their ceramic longsword or their you know monofilament whip you know there's going to be reasons to get up close and personal um but yeah so i think i think in a lot of ways it'll be similar to what people are used to in the spirit of adventure um i just think there will be more going out and exploring the unknown that because in the you know in the pathfinder setting a lot of the setting is known you know, you you might go into a dungeon that nobody's ever been in before, but you you already know about Cheliax. You already know about Andoran. Um, and in the Starfinder setting, we're really taking this approach where you've got the core system, and you've got some worlds that are known beyond that, but outside of that, it's still in the early days of faster-than-light travel. So there's, you know, the average galaxy has, what, 100 billion stars in it? Go forth and explore. You know, you're not you're not going to have any trouble reaching Terra Incognita. Now, what kind of? Now, you mentioned that you originally thought about making this, you know, a companion book for Pathfinder. What has become possible now that you have made it standalone that wouldn't have been possible had it been a companion? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that for a lot of it, um, you know, mechanically, it certainly changed some stuff. Like, uh, we're trying to, with the weapons, uh, mess with the math that underlies everything to give more of an ability to have have different weapons that do fundamentally different things. So, you know, right now there's a very there's this very small range because of the dice used um, between a bad weapon and a good weapon. You know, and there's kind of there's an idea of, well, here's your best weapon for this, and your, here's your best armor. And there's sort of choices you make once. I think we're really trying to play with the, the equipment and the math behind it so that there's the room to have lots of different equipment that is all the best, depending on what you want, um, to make stuff a little less determinative and a little more flavorful. Um, you know, we're going to mess with the way things like armor class work to make, you know, maybe... You know, and I'm not Nothing you know, giving a lot of details. But right? Yeah, but maybe you have uh, armor that's better against lasers, but worse against projectiles and stuff like that. You know, um, to have your your gear choices matter a little bit more and be more interesting. Um, I mean, we're changing we're changing uh, you know the the magic, uh, not necessarily the way that magic works. Um, although a little bit of that is changing, but uh, just the idea of in a world like Pathfinder, all of your technology pretty much is magically based. You know, everybody's everybody's using magic to do anything that they can't do, you know, on on their own through manual labor. In a science fantasy game, you want technology to play a lot of that role too. So you have to ramp back magic in order to give technology some breathing room. Um, and so the balance between those two things has definitely been shifted. Um, so yeah, it's giving us a chance to just kind of kind of streamline some things and introduce some new variables to play with. Yeah, I mean, why? And then of course, setting-wise, things are things are quite different. So that, that brings up the issue, like, why study for years to learn how to cast a fireball when void grenades exist? Exactly. That was, that was one of the very first questions we were facing is, you know, what is, what is the point of that? Like, because you also don't want, you know, do you want your, uh, your laser rifle to be the same price as, you know, a, a magic item that casts fireball? Like, you know, what does that do to the setting? Like, you want people to be able to have cheap laser guns. You want people to be able to have spaceships. You want all of these things that didn't necessarily work in the Pathfinder fantasy-based economy. So we had to change the economy. Um, and in fact, are still changing the economy. That's probably one of the hardest nuts that uh, all the folks working on the rules have had to try and crack. Actually, John Bastille has a question about economy. Will the gold piece be a standard unit of money in Starfinder? No. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's a, I mean, turns out, um, you know, we, we don't use gold anymore and we're not nearly as advanced as the people in Starfinder. Um, so yeah, it won't be the gold standard. Um, I actually am pretty pleased with where we've gone with uh, what the sort of economic 
uh, what the the standard currency is, but I think I'll leave that for mm-hmm. a later date. Star Wars tends to throw the word vibro in front of basic things like an axe <laughs> to make it a space thing, and Star Trek just puts like the name of a planet before it. So, what's the like go to sci fiification word that we're going to see in Starfinder? Oh, I don't, I don't think we have a standard one yet. Um, and no, I mean, I actually, you know, you talk about vibro axes or something. I'm actually really interested on, in when you want to have a primitive, you know, medieval style weapon uh, in the game. I think there are actually interesting ways of explaining how you use that. Like if it's, if it's a blade that's been so sharpened that it's literally one molecule thick at the edge, like that's really cool. So come up with a name based on that idea, right? Um, so I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you'll get the book in a year, and it'll all just be you know tech bone, laser tech sword. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Laser everything. Uh, <laughs> laser but laser. I hope that's not the case. I would be surprised if that was the case. Um, actually, Earlier. hold on one second. My computer is about to die. I need to. Oh, get no. some pa- I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Well, Baron, while we're waiting for James, I can address the audience. Thank you very much, guys. You have had some amazing questions. Um, every now and then, if people are watching the video, you'll just see me glance over and smile because a lot of you guys are very clever. Yes. Uh, so some questions don't get asked, especially if I get the sense that it's a joke. And I, just because it's such a packed interview, I can't ask him every joke question that we got, like uh, the Jay Franklin's Sturge question or uh, Shrike? What was it? Yes, you got it right. The Shrike question? That was one I was like, oh, I think that's a reference I don't get. And then based on James's answer, it ended up being a good answer to that question. But I was worried that it was just going to make him chuckle and then be like, you guys. Mm-hmm. And right. while I appreciate you guys for what you're doing in chat, I, I have to filter out some of the jokier ones for the actual interview. All right, I am back. Sorry about that. This uh, this ate up power a lot quicker than my uh, little battery meter expected. That's all right. Actually, speaking of eating up, uh, we're at like an hour. Are you still good for a little while? Because I've uh, got good. so many yeah, questions. Yeah, I can probably do another 15 minutes or something. Okay. 15 minutes? All right, so we will yeah. try and make sure we get to all the important points. Uh, we haven't really talked about spaceships and interplanetary travel. And I did notice Jason Bowman saying today on Facebook, it's official, he misunder... Uh, he misunderestimated? No, he just <laughs> underestimated the complexity of designing an elegant yet robust starship con- uh, construction and combat system. Right. So sure. where does that leave us? Well, so, uh, you know, he's working very much on starship battles, combat, the sort of the tactical element. Um, in terms of just how how starship movement works, um, you know, the, the story reason behind it is that we've got uh, the, the AI god when it ascended, uh, gave, granted to civilization a form of faster-than-light travel, which works by sending you through a previously undiscovered plane of the multiverse. Undiscovered because you can only access it through technology, not magic. And so, suddenly now, everybody has, not everybody, everybody who can afford it has access to this sort of hyperspace dimension. We probably won't call it that, but that's essentially how it functions. Um, But the interesting thing about this new plane of reality is that every time you jump through it, if you make a little jump, no problem. But if you make a big jump, it actually tears pieces off of the other planes of existence and, and adds to itself. So hyperspace is growing, and it's kind of this big mystery, uh, which also means that sometimes the you know you jump through hyperspace and it rips off a little bit of hell, and suddenly you have an event horizon <laughs> experience where everything's gotten terrible and creepy. You know, we wanted to make sure that that jumping to the edge of the galaxy wasn't too safe, and that you have the the chance for essentially random encounters mm-hmm. or story based encounters. Now, are there native things to this dimension? Um, not decided yet. There's certainly, even if there weren't, now that it's pulling bits of other planes in, there's stuff living there now. But uh, I don't think we've decided if there's any sort of... Because just the concept of that is also exciting for its own... Like, you could, I could see definitely a campaign that just took place inside there, since it's got sure, little pieces right? of everywhere. Yeah. I think... Uh, kind of what we're discovering with this process is every time you answer a question, 
you know, we're asking a whole bunch more, mm -hmm. which is actually how I like to work anyway. You know, I think anytime you, you know, the whole thing about close a door or open a window, um, you always want to have something to be excited and musing about. For the spaceships themselves, how much crew does it take to run one? It depends. You can have a little, I mean, if you want to have a small little fighter, um, you can do that. Uh, you know, we're sort of, certainly there will be a class of ships that you can run with your standard adventuring party. Um, but there's also, you know, there are capital ships out there. You know, there's going to be giant, you know, moon-sized, uh, you know, space structures. So it's really, it scales to whatever you want. Okay, so like basically if we want Battlestar Galactica, we can get that just as well as we can get Firefly? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny, you know, when you ask about influences, like I would say Firefly uh, has been a big influence for us in as much as while their setting is much less fantastical, that idea of you have a crew that's kind of like a family on a ship taking odd jobs, uh, you know, or going on adventures that's Starfinder right there. Like, we really want that Starship crew to be sort of the the basic idea around most adventuring parties. Somebody in chat made a reference to it being like Firefly, but with more aliens. And I can't find it to reference them, but it sounds like they were really going in the right direction. Yeah, or like, you know, I've, I've sometimes described it as like, uh, you know, what Shadowrun is to cyberpunk maybe we could be to space opera. Like, that, I would love to have that be true. I mean, that's awfully grandiose. I think we're all fans of Shadowrun around here. But, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the goals. All right, let's uh, rapid fire through a couple of good questions we've got left. Donato Classic says, is there a possibility of kingdom building rules equivalent in Starfinder? Like terraforming and colonization? Um, I mean, not in the core rule book, but down the road, it's entirely possible. Yes, Moto says, uh, is a little long, but he's basically saying that the technology of our world has advanced since the release of Pathfinder, so how will that influence the release of Starfinder? Um, I'm not sure I follow. Do you mean like, okay, so like will, will the books Earth, be available us, online? <laughs> no, I think like, will there be cool apps that uh, will be at launch or will be early on? Stuff that it took years for Pathfinder get, to get those toys? Oh, Starfinder can um, get early on. Possibly. It's too early to say. Okay. Claw of Orm, the various sky metals. Oh, wait. Uh, no, you know what? We're going to pass on that one. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Claw of Orm. <laughs> he, he got an earlier question. He got the first question. <laughs> so, uh, I know a lot of people, especially this is a Pathfinder podcast, not a Starfinder podcast yet. But they want to know what, how this is going to impact Pathfinder, specifically with releases. So we know that we're getting the Encounter Codex early 2017, and that kind of felt like a softball as far as like the complexity of the product. And then are, we're not getting a Pathfinder a hardcover at Gen Con, right? We're getting Starfinder in its place? You're getting, you're getting Starfinder in its place, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually... I'm not even sure that's true. Sorry, my head has been so buried in in Starfinder that I'm going to be honest and admit that I don't remember what we're releasing for Pathfinder <laughs> um, at Gen Con. But in general, the idea is I I do believe that we are replacing. Yeah, no, we we were replacing one hardcover with another hardcover, but that's not necessarily going to be the way it is going forward. Um, Starfinder is very much in addition to Pathfinder stuff. That said, now, this first core book is going to be a doozy, so we right. kind of need everybody. Over the last couple of years especially, we've seen more of that sci-fi influence on Pathfinder that you were talking about. Now that we've got Starfinder, will Pathfinder start going back to less sci-fi influence, more classic fantasy? I don't really know. I, I sort of expect that like, while Starfinder might reduce the need to do you know, another Iron God style adventure path. Um, I think at the same time, the people working on pa Pathfinder are still going to be excited about whatever they're excited about. So if, you know, Jacobs in, you know, in a year or two is like, you know, I really want to do a, a distant world's adventure path, sounds great to me. And I think nobody would really mind. That said, I do think if we've got an outlet for a lot of science fictional stuff, 
probably we will do more fantasy stuff with Pathfinder. You'll probably you're probably less likely to see things like the tech guide uh, for Pathfinder when we have Starfinder that gives you that that scratches a lot of the same itch. And certainly Starfinder, while being a different and standalone system, will be compatible enough that you can easily take stuff from Starfinder and figure out how to use it in your Pathfinder game uh, with, with kind of minimal effort. Um, and so I think that that might satisfy some of that drive for folks. We're going to take our last question from the audience, and it's a doozy. It's okay. from Alex Agunis. Oh, he Alex. says that in Pathfinder, Earth exists in the Galarian universe. We've, seen, we've had a, an Adventure Path module take place on mm -hmm. our Earth. Absolutely. So will the same hold true in Starfinder? And it's how will that affect Yeah? It's Go the for same it. universe. So Earth is like I, I will just say if Earth was out there before, it's out there now. Will you find it? Hmm? <laughs> That's assuming we haven't blown ourselves up by then. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. We still have to be around. All right. Uh Param, did you have any last questions for James? Uh nothing that can be answered quickly. All right. G <laughs> Well, All actually, right. I got a quick one. The, this yeah, you know, one, go for is, it. I can, I can spin another quick. ten. This is this will be a quick one. Uh, Starfinder Tales, Starfinder Comics. Oh man, I would love to, but first we have to make Starfinder before. <laughs> as tempting as it is to start licensing out a property that doesn't <laughs> exist yet, and, and trust me, I'm planning to. Uh, yeah, the, we got to make the game first. Who would direct the Starfinder the movie? Oh God, uh, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't let anybody else know. Um, I don't know. Uh, definitely not whoever did uh, Jupiter, Jupiter Ascending? Ascending. Yeah. Oh, that was the Wachowski brothers. The Wachowskis, wasn't it? yeah. Mm -hmm. The Wachowskis, yeah, the Wachowskis sisters. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure who would do it. Uh, got any suggestions? Who does chat oh. want to see? As oh, the, all right. I, I actually would really chat. love to know that. There's going to be like a oh, two minute wait, delay. Wait, wait, no, I figured, I figured it out. Uh, Ryan Johnson, you know, when he's finished with uh, with the new Star Wars movie. Oh, of uh, course. Rogue One, or is he doing Episode Eight? He's doing Episode Eight. He's the guy who did Looper, and before that. Uh, oh, I like Looper. Yeah, and a uh, film called Brick that uh, was an amazing noir film. I just oh, think yeah. he's he's, he's yeah, a he's, genius. He leans super noir, so he's the perfect match. Yeah, no, I I could definitely go for his take on Starfinder. <laughs> uh, Bard Wannabe is suggesting Del Toro. Uh, oh, well... Mike, Mike Mahler is suggesting Ula Bowl. <laughs> oh. Mm, I'm not going <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And, he, and uh, Noah Earth... the Noah the Shark is suggesting the Coen Brothers. <laughs> I all fine choices. I think those will all be different flavors, and you could. That's one of the hopes I would have for Starfinder is that you can run a game with each of those flavors using the same book. Actually, Jacob Blackman had a question that I know I said we weren't going to take anymore, but he just says Starfinder it's miniatures, <laughs> and um, like if Pathfinder didn't have Pathfinder battles, there's still like Reaper, there's still enough generic. Pathfinder or yeah. uh, fantasy tools, but there's a lot fewer of that stuff for sci-fi and like so the same thing for maps and stuff. Is that something you're going to try and fast track? Uh, while I cannot say anything, I think it is no secret that Eric Mona is a huge <laughs> minis fan. So I would say if it is possible, Eric will find a way to to make it happen. Which is not saying that it's possible, but like we all know. We all know where his uh, his loves lie. I would be absolutely shocked if um, now I know you can't answer the affirmative or negative. I would be absolutely shocked if Starfinder pawns don't happen. Oh yeah, pawns, of course. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Again, there are a, there is a world of products that I cannot, cannot talk, talk about. about. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. We'll save some of the wild speculation for banter. Cool. <laughs> um, um, do you want to do one more and then we call it? Okay. Uh, no, it looks like chat's cooled off, so why don't you just cut loose? What, what haven't we talked about? Actually, and not just Starfinder. You can talk about Pathfinder Tales. Are you still 
the editor? Are you still the fiction editor? I I am, uh, which is <laughs> which is exactly as terrifying as it sounds. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I'm still I'm still running the line. Uh, Chris Carey, uh, senior editor, is also helping me out with that, doing some development on the books. Um, and actually, we've got a lot of really awesome books coming down the road. Um, one of the ones that doesn't come out till October, but that I'm super excited about is um, a fantasy author named Sam Sykes, who you might know from. Uh, the City Stained Red. He's got uh, some new books out. Really excellent um, uh, sort of up-and-coming fantasy author. Uh, he's got a book called Shy Knives that I'm really excited about. Uh, but, I mean, I'm excited about all of them. We just had Liar's Bargain from Tim Pratt come out, and that's very much a uh, Suicide Squad-style book, except with uh, fa- you know, the heroes, Roderick and Hrim, are basically Fawford and the Grey Mouser if you know, one of them was a talking sword. Uh, so, that you know, we've got that coming out. Um, uh, Wendy Wagner's got Star Spawn in August, which is uh, very much a uh, Vikings v. Cthulhu sort of book. Um, it's got a lot of mythos flavor in there. So that's still that's still rolling along. Oh, and actually, anybody who likes Cheliax or happens to be playing in, like, a Cheliax adventure path right now, uh, Hell Knight, which came out in April, mm-hmm. was amazing. Leanne Merciel knows our canon better than a lot of us do uh and she brought really cheliax to life and the hell knights frankly uh in a way that i think left us all just with our jaws on the floor like really really excellent i have just started hell's rebels so yeah uh not that i wasn't going to pick it up anyway but maybe i'll put it uh, it'll move up on the the order Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, I'm going to admit that I considered just starting this interview just asking you questions about Salim and seeing how long it took you to be like, aren't we here to talk about Starfinder? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I still, I still uh, love questions about Salim. You know, I'm still... It's, it's been a while since the Redemption Engine came out. I guess uh, maybe two years? a year or two. Yeah, something like that. Time flies. But, uh, but, you know, he's still one of my favorite characters I've ever created. You know, I still care deeply about him. Um, would still, would still love to write a third book, as people are often ask. But, uh, well, you can you can see what I'm up to at the moment <laughs> with uh, mm, Starfinder to, consuming we every to, waking hour. We need to keep a lookout to see if he tries to sneak in a space Salim. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, well, he certainly the USS you know, Salim. <laughs> when you've got, captain. The, you've got the goddess of death on your side. Anything's possible, mm. right? Mm. Uh, is there anything non-Pathfinder related? Anything you just want to plug or bring people's attention to? Um, honestly, I would just say, uh, you know, Starfinder is going to have, uh, me- or actually already has message boards on the Paizo uh, website, as well as the Pathfinder boards. We're definitely checking in there and chatting with folks. Um, and then if anybody just wants to talk to me, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter, uh, at James L. Sutter. You know, you can, you can find me there kind of all the time. So if uh, if you didn't get the chance to ask your question in this interview, you can certainly hit me up online. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, James. I'm I'm going to be unabashedly complimentary and say that the more I talk to you, the more impressed I am with your intellect. You just you come off <laughs> when you first meet you, just like you know, casual guy. You can relate on on a personal level, but the more we talk, like you're you're just you're on another level creatively, intellectually. It's it's impressive to me. Dude, th- thank you. Because I, honestly, every time I do an interview, it's always the uh, the desperate race with the tape loop in my brain to make sure I don't say <laughs> terrible. So, <laughs> awesome. All right, well, excellent. Well, uh, yeah. Hopefully, we'll see you at Gen Con. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I we've just concluded, but will there be a Starfinder panel at Gen Con? Uh, I would be shocked if there wasn't. I'm not sure what's planned, but. Well, you've got one that was pre- before the announcement was named Pathfinder in Space. Oh, right, right. We oh. did. It. As with PaizoCon, that uh, is a little bit of a bait and switch because we had to put that in there before we had announced Starfinder. <laughs> yeah, and we're we are scheduled to record nearly all of them, so don't worry, guys. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks yes, again, James. Uh, we will be right back with some other segment. Param, I guess we'll have to decide that in a second. We're going to banter. Well, banter, perfect. We'll be right back with banter right after this. Blah, blah, blah. Pathfinder news. And we're back. The, we're back, uh, guys. The, the video is a little messed up. I'm going to fix it. Uh, but we're back. 
In the path, eh, not the Pathfinder banter. In the banter segment, we talk about our games. We talk about whatever's on our mind as Pathfinder enthusiasts. I think maybe we just need to take a second to digest Starfinder. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, we're all still really excited about what we've heard about this thing so far. Um, I mean, I am. Are you still super pumped? Because it kind of sounded like you were. Yeah, no, very much. Uh, just all of the answers that uh, James was able to give us. And, of course, it is early enough in the setting, or not in the setting, in the design, that um, we couldn't expect him to have answers to all of our questions. Mm -hmm. But even the non-answers were like, here's the direction we're going, here's the things we're thinking, here's the reasons we haven't made this decision yet. Uh, and it, it's all very exciting. And I think as those decisions get made and as more and more solid information is released about this setting, uh, I just expect to get more and more excited to the point that um, I may, if uh, after Hell's Rebels is done, I may have to try and convince my group that we should give Starfinder a try. Not, not necessarily try the first AP, but it's like, let's just sit down and run a month of sessions or whatever. And yeah, my, my group is super pumped about it too. When I asked them about what would they consider uh, playing Starfinder when it came out, the answer was an unequivocal yes to the point that they were willing to put a pause on Reign of Winter if that was what it wow. took. And we are loving Reign of Winter. Like, we are loving this AP. I, it's probably my favorite of the APs that I've ever run. And it is great. But I'm super... Go ahead. But they're super pumped about Starfinder. Why don't you tell us, what's the latest with the Reign of Winter campaign? Okay, uh, well, we have, we're doing the early parts of book two. Um, okay. So it's, it's the... And without too much spoilers, this is a, a long travel segment with lots of cool random encounters that's basically, hey, here, let's introduce you to Irison and all the kooky things that can happen in here. It's If you've been through a Pathfinder society in Irison, you can kind of expect what it is. It's like, ooh, creepy fae. Ooh, the, the animals here talk and want to kill you. Um, <laughs> why does everybody cool with the troll in the village? I mean, crazy things like that. And, of course, the ever present of i'm pretty sure somebody's watching us because i'm pretty sure somebody's always watching us while we're here <laughs> it's really easy to be paranoid and scared of everything in irison it's funny what you know about adventure paths that you haven't played like i could have summarized books one i think four and five of reign of winter mm -hmm. but you're telling me you're in book two and it's like i can't even picture what's in book two i don't know what's on the cover i don't know if they're traveling somewhere crazy yet um, they have not got the hut yet. Okay, so they haven't okay. got the hut, so they're not doing the crazy travel yet. Uh, the book book one was them in Taldor, and most of it takes place in Taldor, and this is in Irison. So they have traveled a great deal of distance, but not the great deal of distance they will travel. Okay, then it sounds like what I would have summarized as book one, it sounds like that's where book two is. Yes, yes. So, so what you probably thought book one was is split into book one and book two. And then book three is when the crazy stuff happens. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and I'm trying not to spoil it too much because no, of blessfully, course. blessfully several of my players are not spoiled on Rain of Winter somehow. <laughs> I don't know why. And a few of them are. And they have this conspiratorial little giggle when they start talking to each other. And like, oh, yeah, sure. I'm the... Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm sure, Gunslinger, you'll be able to find some equipment later. Because <laughs> my Gunslinger is not spoiled. And he's wondering, like, man, did I pick the wrong class? If we're going to be right. traveling a lot, how in the world am I going to get new equipment? Nobody's going to have guns. <laughs> Can I make bullets out of bones and ice? <laughs> I've been super lenient on letting him get supplies at town. That's good. It's like, oh, yeah, the blacksmith, he'll have a whole lot of random stuff, and I'm sure the, the, the witch over there has got the other random alchemical ingredients you need. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't... When, when, the, when the player's playing a class that requires special setup, unless I have a very specific reason to make his life difficult or her life difficult, I try to just lean, lean leniency unless it's a disruption. Now, I'm kind of surprised to hear you're already in book two just because of the pace... I know you played um, Rise of the Rune Lords. Do you find you're going through this one more quickly? No, no. Um, Rise of the Rune Lords went by a lot faster than this one, and Raina and um, uh, Wrath of the Righteous was a lot faster. But a lot of that is book one 
is notorious for being stupidly long. Like, hmm. massively long. Um, you know how they label encounters A, B, C, D for the encounter areas you're in for the sure. maps? Um, book one has encounter area Q. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it, you get, like, twice throughout the story, I was pretty sure this is where book two starts. No, no. Several times it looks like you're ready to go into book two, and you have had enough encounters to qualify it. Um, but no, you're still in book one. And then when you do get to book two, uh, it is also on the long side. Like this traveling is a crazy amount of travel encounters, like way more than I usually put, even though they're going to be traveling weeks. This is like an encounter a day for a, set, right. a multi-week trip. Well, considering <laughs> what I thought was book one, which didn't, mm -hmm. in my mind, it's not a complicated plot. The fact mm -hmm. that it's, spread over two books mm -hmm. there must be a lot of just random stuff and just exploration encounters going on it's a lot like of it have to be it's a, it's a lot of exploration it's a lot of survival survival is a huge key of it and a lot of social encounters because fey and witches are like the main antagonist right now so it's a whole lot of social encounters uh every every encounter almost can be resolved multiple ways depending on what they're doing there's a lot of mysteries nothing is like it seems like almost every encounter is like this is what you expect you're doing but this is what you're going to actually end up doing um and then, and then lots of russian folklore and fairy tales and craziness so it, it really blends in well excellent oh are you is there anything specific coming up in the next few sessions that you're particularly looking forward to um, the, they just hit the one thing I was really looking forward to them, to them doing. Uh, the next few sessions are going to be okay. I'm really looking forward to when they finally get to White Throne, um, which is the capital of Irison, because then you're going to get to see what Irison's really like, and I really want to see them get the hut. I mean, that's that's the that's that's sort of like what we're going for. That's the whole crux of the adventure, and once they start messing around with the hut that's when i'm really going to be excited are your players experiencing any kind of travel fatigue um i think they're getting there now the first one was a lot of survival and they they traveled but it was a short distance like it took a in game it only took place over i think a week's worth of time in game time not obviously play time uh, but this one is like lots and lots of travel and lots of seemingly random encounters and let's be honest a lot of them are just straight up would have been random encounters if if you were playing it any other way mm -hmm. um so i'm kind of hoping that the 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 travel lightens up a bit because even i'm starting to get so fatigued of oh we're going to spend another session traveling through the snow that will have no impact on the plot <laughs> Alex in chat says, and I, I appreciate that you and Alex have this weird parallel going on between your adventures. You both <laughs> played Wrath of the Righteous up to about at the same point when you both quit. Yep. Then you both started Reign of Winter. He says that his group just finished the clock tower. We have not got that far yet. Okay, so he's a little ahead of you now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does not surprise me. My, my group is uh, lots of people with children. Mm. and real lives so like we we play most weeks but usually at least once a month we have to call it off yeah i think that's around what my group's at now so we ended rise of the rune lords a month and a half ago i would say <laughs> and we just got our first play session of hell uh, hell's rebels in last week okay. so it, before that, we fit in uh, a session zero where we built our characters and established some relationships and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like session one was last week. So that was a long time between sessions, longer than usual for us. But it's, it's similar reasons. We've got more kids in, or more parents in the group than we had before. Uh, PaizoCon meant that I had to miss a week. And our GM, Jeff, uh, travels a lot for his job. So uh, when he was just a player, it was fine. He would miss the occasional session, and sometimes he would even Skype in. But as the GM, we need him. We need him in the room, preferably. Right. But he's accommodated the remote players, because our situation is uh, we play at my house, but uh, of the group, Matt is 100% of the time remote. Every now and then, if he's visiting Montreal for a reason, then he will be at the table. But otherwise, he's in Ottawa. It's a couple of hours away, so... 
he skypes in every time and jay uh because of his white well his girlfriend situation she has two kids and split custody so she gets the kids every other week so any week that she has the kids he's playing from home and any kids that any week that she doesn't have the kids he go he comes here Mm -hmm. so uh every other week essentially we've got two remote players and so um jeff's gone full roll 20 we don't have miniatures this time we don't have maps everything's being played on a flat screen that he's concocted like a frame for so three of the people around the table are just looking at the screen and matt uh, sorry jeff is manipulating it okay. meanwhile matt's at, at his location is manipulating his own character jay when he's remote will be manipulating his own character on the screen i could i no, i can't do that <laughs> neither could i but you know i don't like prepping right uh, and world 20 is lots of prepping like it, it does not save you work it adds work to play on world 20. yeah especially because um so hell's rebel starts with a protest this isn't spoiling anything it's all over the player's guide in fact after you pick your trait you're supposed to pick a reason that you're protesting so you can't start the campaign until you know why you are at this protest it's the very first scene Uh, and you've got multiple options of what to do with the protest and it just so happened that kathy picked a rather uh volatile option and then her first role of the campaign was like a two or a three uh-huh. And so, um, un- much more quickly than Jeff was expecting, we got into the first combat of the campaign. And so he was kind of prepared, but he was mostly prepared for all of the other stuff we were supposed to be able to do at the uh, at the protest. And uh, it was it was an intense fight. We're first level, so there's only so much we can do. Uh, it went on a long time because, again, first level is a lot of swings and misses. And it's a lot more dependent on the dice. Plus, we don't know our characters just yet. We've got our ideas. We've got our concepts. We built to our concept. But most of us won't really actualize our concepts for another couple of levels. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it was looking a little tense for a little bit. But eventually, we did pull through. We didn't lose any of our characters. We didn't lose the Animal Companion. Who actually, Animal Companions start with two hit dice. The Animal Companion was the tank of the group. Um, uh, but basically the whole first encounter was we show up at this protest long combat breaks out and then we leave and Jeff was willing to cut the session early because um, he was like so there's a couple of things that can happen as you're fleeing I'd rather play them when I'm fully prepared for them so we were all kind of bummed because we were still into it even if the campaign was a little or even if the combat was a little long and very first levely Mm -hmm. um but what was great was that we just started um, tossing just little exchanges in character back and forth. And then uh, instead of ending the session early, Jeff just kind of let it run. And we just played out multiple character interactions over the next half hour of the session. Just We all knew exactly who our characters were. We all had a really good grasp of why we cared about Cheliax, why we were there. And uh, it ended up like ending on such a strong role-playing note that I have really high expectations for this campaign now because just after that one session, which in describing it, almost nothing happened, but what happened was so engaging. I am very excited. Well, I I like that you're saying that it has lots of, like, the roleplay only sessions because, like, that's, you know, that's the ones I like the most and I'm glad this seems to have the potential. I thought it would, but then it's really hard to do that in a canned adventure. Or, mm. And I know we're not supposed to use the C word with adventures. But, um, <laughs> a prepared adventure. Prepared. Although that, anyone can prepare an adventure. Right. Uh, I, I, a published and, adventure. And I guarantee that a lot of the times it's a very unprepared adventure. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, Alex so, has a great question in chat. He wants to know if Jeff's luck is any better digitally. As most people know, Jeff uh, is is one of the unluckiest people I know. It's just mm-hmm. one of those things that it's like, yeah, but luck isn't real. Luck is just a, a constructed concept of humanity. And yet, Jeff fulfills his reputation as a very unlucky roller. He had five natural ones this session. He did not roll a natural 20. The, uh, that's Jeff. Tell Kathy me. was almost as bad, and she almost has the same reputation as Jeff. But no, Jeff... 
digitally rolls as poorly. It's just something about the universe does not want Jeff to luck out. I mean, luck is just an observed phenomenon as the result of random chance statistically and mathematically, but... Listen, I want but, to agree with you. But mathematically, there has to be a Jeff. Like, <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he's odd. Monica's still... chat says she knows how he feels. Yep. Uh, well, Mort Undos asked in chat whether or not I had any deaths yet. Uh, mm. No, and I'm actually a little worried about that because this is one of those campaigns that will make deaths hard to deal with. The similar, mm. like, I, I it spoils too much to go into it, but it would be very hard to deal with a death in this party. Monica also, Monica Marlow, who uh, also writes for the network, she says the protest is fun, especially when PCs die. Monica, I didn't realize you were playing in or running Hell. No, probably not running. I didn't realize you were in Hell's Rebels. We'll have to chat about that. So, uh,. A lot of people at PaizoCon were asking me what happened to my Rise of the Rune Lords campaign. So uh, I don't think, I think I heavily implied we were going to end the last time I talked about it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, PaizoCon happened and a lot of, we've had a lot of really like, either I was sick one episode, last episode we had to end suddenly. So we really haven't gone into it. Uh, but we, my group effectively had a TPK. Oh. And by then they were already fairly far off the rails. So at one point, you're investigating something, mm -hmm. without spoiling, and you have multiple paths uh, to follow this investigation, and you do have a couple of clues that lead you to two specific paths as the good ones, which my group picked up on. But then they went down the first path and um, immediately got into fights with people instead of investigating. And so uh, when it came time, they found the thing that they were supposed to find, had no idea it was the thing they were supposed to find because they never talked to anyone about it. So they teleported back to town to heal and they sold the thing. They sold the MacGuffin they were looking for. So that was one issue. This was, okay, actually, uh, this was session two of the last three sessions. Session one of the last three sessions, they had a fight which was very light on plot impact but they got destroyed. They were killed almost to the man. Um, everyone was either dead or unconscious except for two PCs. We whisked them back. Uh, they healed up the wounds. They came back prepared to fight that monster, but that monster wasn't there anymore. But ultimately, that, I think, was really the first step towards Rise of the Rune Lords ending for us because it was so unrelated to the plot and so discouraging that here they are thinking they're going to save the universe, and yet this random monster killed them. Um so that when we finally got to our last session, the third of our last three sessions, and they were once again TPK'd, this time uh, largely aided by Jay's character, who was a swashbuckler, who I know um, Alex is not going to believe this, but he is the leading damage dealer and almost impossible to hit. Uh, he, he was just a combat monster in that campaign. So uh, he was dominated. He turned around and just started killing people. Uh, at one point, Matt's character was Breath of Life and then tried to flee, and he fled right through, I forget the name of the spell, but it's something from uh, Occult Adventures that we weren't, like, the group wasn't super familiar with, but Kathy had summoned it, and it's basically an invisible wall of knives. So Matt's character got revived, got up, tried to flee to safety, and just stabbed himself on this invisible wall of knives. Um... It was basically down to Jay, who was dominated and just could not make that will save, and Corey's character, who was a rogue who regularly rolled 60s on his stealth, and actually barely did anything in that last combat, mostly just protected himself and walked around trying to set up good flanks. So he was at full, everyone else was pretty much dead, and it was like, you guys already sold this MacGuffin, I'm thinking this, you've lost two combats, just terribly beaten, so... Does anyone even want to continue with the campaign? And ultimately, no. The decision was that we'll call this one a loss. We can say we've experienced Rise of the Rune Lords. It sucks that we didn't get to finish it, but that's where we are with this campaign. We're okay ending it here. We definitely, everyone was more okay ending it there than finding some cockamamie reason why that TPK kind of didn't happen, like sending in a rescue squad of alternate PCs or starting whole new PCs and going from there with the adventure. Like, nobody liked the alternatives. So we called it a campaign. And 
we haven't really looked back. No one's been like, man, I regret that decision. Hmm. I mean, you know, I hate that TPEs happen, but it sounds like you guys are having more fun now anyway. So, more. I mean, I I hate that it ended because I really liked Raz the Rune Lords, and it gets... It gets into some fun places after where they were at. In fact, they were in the, my favorite part of the whole campaign, I think. Uh, just to address Alex's comment in chat, he's saying he believes it because the swashbuckler is super good if it has an 18 to 20 crit weapon. Uh, Jay's crit range was 15 to 20. So right. he never suffered for panache. I mean, why would you play a swashbuckler and not use a rapier? Uh, talk to Alex. Yeah, Alex uh, made a character with a 19 to 20 crit range and then uh, hated the swashbuckler class for it. Right. I mean, it's basically a, the weapon inspired the, the class, not the other way around. Oh, mm. well. Oh, well. And Nohar, the chat has a good question. Did you have a here's what happened to the world since you failed synopsis? I did now that you mention it. Oh, let's see. So did the world die? No, I kind of... Uh, so we actually ended it with Jay and Corey's characters both still alive and kind of staring down at each other. And while we were discussing what we would do with the next session, uh, Corey was really dragging his feet about voting on whether he was okay ending the campaign or not. And eventually he admitted it's because he's just researching a million books trying to find the numerical solution to the problem, which just killed my enthusiasm as the GM. So I was like, no. Here's what happened. You try and leave. Everyone dies. Uh, I, I did kind of a recap of the last session from everyone's point of view and then just what happened after Corey left. Uh, but no, come to think of it, I didn't actually say what happened to the rest of the world. I guess we'll never know. Uh, and then you said something, Param, before... I wanted to handle Alex's question first. Then I wanted to get back to what you were saying. Me and Al but if we go to that, it's just me and Al Alex arguing. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, sorry, no. You were just saying you liked Rise of the Rune Lords, so I will take a lot of the responsibility for my players not being super engaged with the campaign. It was the fear I had going into it that uh, I would I, I have poor uh, information retention, and so canned campaign just terrified me. It meant that when I should be thinking about what I should remember. I am beating myself up mentally for not having a better memory for that stuff and trying to find it in the book. And it's just like so much, you don't, like three parts of my brain are active and one of them is just like, you are doing this wrong, Ryan. <laughs> and so like, I, I don't like running canned adventures. I love just improvising. That's the stuff that I am so much more comfortable with. And this was the lesson. This was like, before it was a fear, now it's a lesson learned. It's an experience. I just, I can't run a canned adventure. Oh. Well. At least you can. Nah, I don't. I have lots of, uh, of, uh, of lots of pleasantries I could say in response to that. But you know, there's two types of GMs out there, and you're the yep. one that doesn't like to prep. Yeah, I'm not saying that I've got any problem with canned adventures existing. I mm -hmm. just know it's not for me. Right, right. Hey, but I one of the, the if you remember the Dungeon Masters two. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. The uh, fourth edition or the second or third edition? Third edition one. Okay, so I, I do remember I that. I do one. love the fourth edition one. It's probably which is why I needed you yeah, to clarify. Yeah, yeah. But no, the third edition, three point five edition Dungeon Master two has a lengthy, uh, a lengthy expose of what to do with adventure canned adventures if you don't like running canned adventures, and it's basically um, cannibalize it for stuff that you don't want to make yourself. So right. you have access to all that. I don't know if I said this on the podcast or just in a couple of conversations at PaizoCon, but um, I have considered running uh, Shattered Star just because I've heard that it's plot light and just is like two dungeon delves per book. And it's like, well, that's fine. I don't mind just using their, their encounters and stuff and using their maps. That's fine. And just being able to slap my own story on it, that, that might be the perfect solution. I might even like that better than just improvising everything. Mm -hmm. Bard wannabe asks, wants to know are PFS scenarios too much no PFS scenarios are my limit the ones that have their own built in subsystems I've had a little more trouble with uh, library of the lion I had a lot of trouble with because there's a lot of like there's small things like if 
like there's music playing in the background, and if somebody asks the right questions about it, you can make them make the right role, and then they might get an advantage in a certain situation. And it is so situational that it was not even worth me paying attention to. And yet, for some reason, that's a detail I definitely remember about that scenario. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like there was a lot going on. I managed to download a lot of really handy game, uh, game master aids which is pretty much the only reason that I was able to run it as smoothly as I did, but I just I didn't enjoy running that one. Not because I disliked the scenario, but because it was a very preppy scenario. I often don't like the super gimmicky PFS ones because it's it doesn't seem like a format that lends itself to gimmicks because you you got limited time frame to try to explain and understand and run with the people that are only going to see this content once. Yeah. Every now and then I've been in one that was run by a GM that really just integrated it really smoothly and that's great. But I think you have a very you have to have a very specific ability to understand a subsystem and understand how to uh just n uh, run a very crunchy campaign narratively mm -hmm. or not campaign but adventure. So it it's a very specific skill to get that kind of scenario down right. And it's fine. It just means that as a player I'll tend or not as a player as a GM I'll tend to avoid them. And there's enough feedback in the Pathfinder Society forums and the GM forums that I'll be able to know way ahead of time if it does have a crazy subsystem. Cool. True. I mean, we didn't really get to my PaizoCon stories last episode. It's a little less timely, but I, I've got stories if you want, or I, we could talk about things I, I purchased. Well, what was your haul? What was my... Oh, my haul. Um, I got... So I, I tried not to buy too many things at PaizoCon because, you know, it's just weight in my bags when it's something that I could buy at home. Right. So I try to get the things that really I don't expect my local stores to get. Uh, one of the things I've got handy is the Cobalt Guide to Combat. Mm -hmm. So Cobalt Quarterly puts... Or sorry, Cobalt Press puts out these guides to books. Uh, they've got a guide to magic. They've got the two different ones to game design. One of them is role playing. Actually, no, they've got three. One of them is world building. One of them is uh, game design as a role player, and one of them is game design as a board gamer. And I love every one of these books that I've picked up. And I didn't even know about the guide to combat, but uh, there's a series of essays written by a large variety of people. I think there's an Ed Greenwood in here. Let me see. Essays by Wolfgang Bauer, of course, Clinton Boomer, uh, Ed Greenwood, Jeff Grubb. Rob Heinsu, Miranda Horner, Colin Meckholm. So actually not a lot of... Oh, Richard Pett. I was going to say not a lot of people that Pathfinder-specific fans will recognize. You know, some, but it's a variety of people from all walks of the gaming industry. Uh, just given their ideas about how combat works, why it's important, how to portray it, historical issues, like basically anything they are passionate about on that topic. They write an essay about it, and then I get to read experienced, intelligent people talking about something they're passionate about. Uh, I love the format of these books, and even if there's no crunch, because they're system neutral, and it's really just like advice and thought-based essays, really, really enjoyable. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but when I do, I will give it a proper review. I also picked up the medium and large bases in red, green, and blue. Mm -hmm. So... I was going to buy uh, one of each size and one of each color, mm -hmm. and they go from medium to huge, but the huge packs were like $5 each and for only like four of each, whereas the mediums were like three bucks and you get a, a whole stash of them. So by the time I was starting to calculate, like if I grab those three, that's another like 20 bucks and that's really taking a chip into my budget. And how often do I have a huge swarm? that I really need to differentiate them with a variety of colors. Well, if you had continued through Rise of the Rune Lords, you, the, the ending encounter, I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten huge creatures on the field. Wow. Um, All the same large, type? No. But well, then the different two of them were, were the same type. Okay. On opposite sides of the battle. Okay. Um, and then there was a few mediums and a couple of larges. I mean, there was 20 things on the field. <laughs> so multiple creatures, the color coding would be great. <laughs> and, and here's the thing is, um, oh wait, multiple types. Yes, but not the way you meant. 
there was four of one type of giant and then the three okay. of another. So, yeah, if I wanted to differentiate, this is the blue one. But actually, I would have used it with faction because some of them were on one side of the battle and some of them were on the other. And that right. would have been, I would want to know, these are good guys, these are the bad guys. And the, and but that's just one encounter you can think of that you would really make use for a lot of multicolored Several encounters pieces. in that book are like oh, that. Oh, several? Okay. And then, and then uh, Wrath of the Righteous... Well, it's mythic. Uh, there was multiple encounters where it's here's four or five huges on the field at the same time. And in that case, it was often a bunch of here's 1D8 of this type of huge demon. Wow. I can also give them credit that you don't have to use them to differentiate minis. You can do it for different conditions mm -hmm. or spell effects. So, like, if somebody has a spell that constantly catches people on fire and you know this PC is constantly using it, then having that red base to swap out so that you remember which guys are on fire, that would be handy. Uh, we'll see the next time I run, because I don't know when the next time I'm going to GM is, which is kind of weird, and I don't know when I'll be using a huge figure. I just know that when while Jeff's GMing, he doesn't need these bases since we're on roll 20 now. So I purchased these knowing I have no idea when I'm going to use them, but I do look forward to when I will use all these bases. Yeah, and it's an alternative to the tried and true method that I've seen and used is, is going to the teacher supply store, getting those star stickers of the different colors that you would put on homework assignments if you were handing them out to kids and then putting the different colored stars on the bases. Otherwise, in my hall, I brought down some of the stuff and have started putting it away. Oh, I did pick up one of the goblins. I got the Lictoed Goblin. So, you cool. know, the we've been calling them action figures. They are not. They have no posability. They have swappable hands well, and DC swappable gear. Well, calls them action figures. So no, they're wrong. They <laughs> well, have zero points of articulation. All which means of these figures figure. are exactly like that. Zero points of articulation. All of really? these figures are. Yeah, I've got a. They don't even. Well, you saw the picture I posted up on Facebook of my new office. Yes. It's a shelf full of things. Almost like a good thirty of those are DC uh, deluxe action figures, and they have zero points of articulation. <laughs> Oh, man. When I get to the shout-outs, we are going to be talking about something with a million points of articulation that I'm super happy about. Yeah. That's a lot and, Param, I think that might be it for my haul. I guess there's one other thing that this is a fun souvenir. There was the Pathfinder Society scavenger hunt. Mm -hmm. That's weird. So you uh, got to mark off these boxes. Player GM a session of the Pathfinder role-playing game. GM would mark it off, play a session of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, participate in a PaizoCon Delve, uh, which I participated in a couple. I got Nick Logue, Owen Casey Stevens, and uh, shoot, what's his name? Curtis Weeb, the writer for um, Rat Queens. He was there and he was running Delves, and I got to run in the one of the Rat Queen Delves this year. Participate in an activity or demonstration sponsored by one of Paizo's licensed partners, such as Obsidian, Reaper, Sirenscape, or Trapdoor. I did. I actually... Uh, Ben Looms recorded me uh, <laughs> growling like a dragon and, or sorry, not, or like roaring like a dragon. And I actually lost my voice just screaming into this microphone repeatedly. But uh, I make quite a dragon, Param. I might go pro. Awesome. Ben knows how to run a convention. Like, the man is like the perfect con representative. Yep. So anyway, there's a couple of other check marks. Get signs from uh, Paizo's operations staff, editorial staff, and the more check marks you got, the better boon you got. But it was a one-off boon that could only be used at PaizoCon, and I never used it. So uh, oh, what was it's the just you something got? that I now have uh, my hands on. Because what I was might the boon? repeat this for Gen Con. You might want to. We might want to pay attention. Uh, I think it's specific. It says PaizoCon specifically, oh, and I, if they do redo this idea, I don't want to spoil what the boon is. Oh, well, okay. Well, you know, this boons, that's discovery. It's part of part of Pathfinder society. Mm -hmm. I guess I could be reporting on the boon. Nope, I've decided not to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, looking over the stuff I had around me, I don't think... Oh, I did pick up... <laughs> so, um, my local comic shop is bad when I add something to the pull list. They're bad about getting me issue number one. It's a weird trend that's happened. So I've had number two through six of the latest Pathfinder comic, um, the Hollow Mountain. Hollow Mountain. 
and I've been waiting to get number one because I don't read just in the middle of a comic series anymore. Mm -hmm. That's kid stuff. Uh, so yeah, so I, w the one thing I wanted to buy when I got to PaizoCon was Hollow Mountain number one. And when I got to the store, they just didn't have the floppies. <laughs> they did not have any of the individual comics for sale. And so that was kind of a bummer. And I was like, well, now I'm going to have to track it down, which I know can be tough with Dynamite stuff because they send, they, they send unsold copies back to the publisher. But luckily, I sat in on the Pathfinder Comics panel, which was James Sutter, Wes Schneider, and Eric Mona. And the audience was me and one other gentleman. So oh. we got just a private conversation. It was it was amazing experience. It was as intimate, sorry, as intimate as a seminar can get. And then at the end, they just had piles of all the comics, and they said, "You guys, you're the only people here, so take whatever you want." All I wanted was Hollow Mountain number one, so I grabbed that. I even got James Sutter to sign it because he was the one that wrote that particular installment of it. And now I can say I've got the whole series. I've read the whole one. And I intend to, uh, sorry, read the entire series, and I intend to review it the next time we do a Read Magic segment. Sweet. Sweet. I don't know what I'm going to review in Read Magic segment. I've read a lot of Pathfinder stuff that was in between Read Magic segments. We haven't done one in a while. It's true. We're due. I picked up a couple of chem companions at PaizoCon. I picked up the Magic Tactics Toolbox. Mm -hmm. Ooh, That's a good actually, one. I like that one. So I picked that up and the armor uh, master something, handbook. not toolbox. It, yeah, it is handbook, isn't it? Yeah. So I haven't cracked that one yet because in Hell's Rebels I'm playing uh, an oracle. So the magic tactics toolbox is very much more in line with what I'm going to use. But this gives me an idea of a topic for banter, and we've still got enough time. So one thing that Jeff did as the GM uh, that I have never done and the camp, my group has rarely done he really put a limit on the number of books you can have oh so he uh laid out all of the hard covers that were considered uh, open options for everybody which really included most of them he was he was very generous with it he took occult adventures off of that list because thematically it doesn't work and so he wants to stick to a little bit more of the theme and i don't blame him for that and at first he didn't have ultimate intrigue on the list because it was too new he hadn't read it and so he didn't feel comfortable allowing it but then Matt put up the argument that Ultimate Intrigue really does have a lot of good charisma-based options. Yeah, it was basically a book for this. this adventure path. Exactly. And so Jeff uh, reneged. He put it on the list. And then his last note... Uh, so anyway, it's most of the hardcovers, plus the Intercity World Guide, Hell's Revels Player's Guide, Cheliac's Empire of Devils, Heroes of the Streets, plus three books specific to your character subject to GM review. So I've got the Magic um, Tactics Toolbox, and already in it, I'm uh, sorry, I'm an Oracle of the Bones, and so I'm trying to find as many bone-themed spells, and there is one of them that is really cool and really bone-themed, and you're giving someone, like, you're, you're making the bones protrude from people, almost like uh, mini doomsdays, mm -hmm. and it gives them natural weapons and a little natural armor, and it's great for an Oracle, because as a spontaneous caster, this is something... Those are two bonuses that are always useful. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to spam that stuff or to always have that in my toolbox sounds great. But I can't just decide if I want that spell on my spell list as an oracle who's already got a limited number of spells known. I also have to make the decision if this is worth being one of the three books specific to my character. This is where I'm going to be controversial and probably upset some people. I can't really respect that style of play for Pathfinder. Um, okay. I understand why. I understand why, but I just feel that it means you don't trust your players to play their characters and know their character and to not cheat. Um, I don't need to know what your oracle does. I just need to trust you know what your oracle does. And if there's a problem, then we have a bigger problem than your oracle. Well, with my group, we kind of do have a bigger problem than the Oracle. There is often times where people don't know their character as well as they should. Hmm. Uh, there's just assumptions being made. We, many of us look at the rules differently than each other. And so the GM wants to make sure that he's got a tighter grip on it. And he even admits in here, his first thing to note on his list is, I'm kind of new. And so he wants to make sure that he's comfortable with everything. This is actually a learning experience for Jeff. And so by limiting the options, he gets to learn what the rules are about. And he wants to limit the amount of rules arguments. 
and he wants to limit the power of the people that prefer to find the two uh, dis, uh, like unassociated rules that when you put them together you've got a nuclear reaction hmm. so he is being a lot more controlling of that kind of stuff but I have a feeling if he hadn't played with our group he would be less so this is a learned behavior. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned rules arguments, and, like, there are no rules arguments at my table. Well. There are discussions afterwards, but there are nope. no arguments. <laughs> we rarely have the discussion afterwards. Usually, the majority of the group wants to have it at the table. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it, that's what the majority is more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, it's your, you, your group, you guys have fun the way you want to have fun, but... Man, every time I hear that, man, like the GM's like, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. I'm like, come on, dude. Do your research or trust your players. If you're not willing to do the research or, and the player's not willing to do the research, then fine. That just means you've got a problem before you even started. Yeah, but he's got the solution to the problem. He, he's only got as much time as he has. He's a busy guy. So he can't, research, he can't know the rules as well as people that have been playing it forever. And he doesn't trust the players. And he's admitting this, <laughs> and this is deserved. So yeah. he's got, I mean, and it's, yes, it's a limited list, but plus three other books. Uh, I haven't seen him reject anything yet, except mm -hmm. I think Words of Power, which was just <laughs> a headache he did not want to have. Man, that, that, I, I, I would, at first, that's an optional rule, so he's completely justified nailing that one right away. And even I don't like Words of Power at my table because, not because it's bad or can be broken, but it can be broken. Yep. And it's fun to break it. Yep. Um, but, it's, but you can break so many other things so much harder. But it just slows play down at the table to such a crawl that mm. I have completely abandoned it. I mean, I had a freaking app written to support it, and I didn't even <laughs> finish it. I was like, no, this is no. And, and look, Paso agrees. We haven't seen a single word of power since the release of that book. Well... Whether you agree with it or not, Param, this is how Jeff is running it. So mm -hmm. that has become a new decision point for me. So uh, luckily, I was planning on reading this book with a fine tooth comb anyway, and making a decision. Or and uh, so, like, I will be able to make an informed decision whether that one spell is the only spell I'll get a use out of, or if in a few levels I'll be able to uh, find another option that'll make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll just be like, ah, this is one book with one option, and I'll just have to make sure my other two options are a little more versatile. Well, it's a but it is a new book. reality of this campaign for me. Yeah, It's a good book, and it does put some uh, thought into your brain about how you're going to pick it. So I guess it has some tactical versatility. And it will prevent, I guess it will prevent the players from just going for, these are the best options in the game currently, statistically, and as argued about on the forums to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, cool. I don't have there were a couple else. of... <laughs> things in chat I didn't get to so let's see Ash Saber next time Ryan head into Seattle so to Golden Age collectibles I want uh, I went there the last day and that place was awesome uh, honestly it's unlikely I do that really when I go to PaizoCon I maximize my time at PaizoCon so if I arrive a day early or were to stay a day late it would be to hang out with the other people that are there a day early and a day late and to get in either a little more gaming or just some more conversations because every year uh, there's just like man I know I bumped into this person three times but I never had a good conversation with them and I've gotten pretty good at like making a note when I leave one PaizoCon of who to talk to more than next PaizoCon so there's still some people that I'd, I'd really like a good sit down conversation because it's been a few years but like this year I had a really great chat with Tim Nightingale that obviously could have been longer, but at least I got in that good chat this year because that's not something I got in last year. So um, as cool as Golden Age Collectibles, I'm sure it is, uh, that's not why I'm there. I have the same... Uh, Jacob Blackman says, didn't you sign up for the Humble Bundle because there's PDFs of the three Hollow Mountain comics? And actually, no, I didn't get into the Comic Humble Bundle. Oh. Uh, I sat on the fence for too long. Or maybe I did and just never downloaded it. <laughs> I, I definitely got into the RPG one. I don't think I did both. I mean, that's me and all the Humble Bundles. Is like I have like hundreds of games in Humble Bundle. I've downloaded like five of them. 
<laughs> Let's see. Uh, Alex says, aka pick, Ryan picked up the Alex Suite. Oh, uh, the two books that I picked up, Alex worked a great deal on. Yes, Alex, you do good design work, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're fond of it. We're also biased. Bard Wannabe, have you considered Swarm of Fangs from Monster Codex? I have not considered Monster Codex options. It's not one of the hardcover source books that was allowed. And I and don't know a hard if, argument, too. Uh, if it was something from an undead section, specifically if there was a skeleton section, but I don't think there was. I think the only undead was vampires, right? Hmm. Swarm of Fangs. Huh. It might fit in. You know what? I'll ask Jeff because I am going for something a little bit creepier with this character and so having something a little bit monster focused uh, it, he might allow it I might be able to come up with a good argument for it uh, what do you think Param more Pizocon stories or do we wrap this one up I think we're ready to wrap it up I'm okay with that too we'll be right back with wrap ups and shout outs right after this Thank you for joining us for episode 135 of No Direction, the Pathfinder News Reviews and Interviews podcast. Thank you once again for James Sutter for joining us, uh, really dishing out a lot of great detail about Starfinder. Uh, we are more interested and more intrigued than ever before about this, and I'm looking forward to finding out more as the months go on. Before we go, we want to bring your attention to some things that might be of note to you as Pathfinder enthusiasts. One of them is going to be a little bit more complicated. Actually, both of my shoutouts are a little complicated and off of the usual pattern param. So if you have any shoutouts, I'll encourage you to go first. No, no, go ahead. All right. So uh, before I get to my first shoutout, I'm going to give an update on uh, A Nomen Need, the Millie Narstead adventure that is super late from our Kickstarter a couple of years ago. And it's 100% my fault. What has happened far too often is I have sat down to work on it and had writer's block, and it's really a frustrating situation because I'm not used to it and just knowing that I have ideas and not being able to formulate them and write them is just baffling to me and in my day job I'm able to go and be creative and do the writing that I need to do there but anytime I come home there have been eight hour days where I've had like I've booked out time I made sure Tina went with Scarlett somewhere and I was just me alone in the computer and I could not be productive the book should be done by now but it's not, and it's not for lack of trying, but it is for lack of accomplishing on my part. That said, actually, no, so going on then, I can tell you that the first section is done. The way this adventure is supposed to work is that the first part is just part one. It's a, it, it makes you find a, uh, an artifact that has eight um, figures carved into it, and that's basically your Mega Man Select screen. And so you go into these demi-planes created, tied to each of these individual um, uh, uh, figures, three of which, four of which actually, I've now gotten freelancers to agree to write to. So Adam Daigle and Mark Moreland were both stretch goals. Both of them are still 100% on board to write their parts. Adam Daigle is writing his now. Mark Moreland uh, has to carve out a little more free time. But again, that's not his fault. He's, he's actually been one of the best people at poking me and being like, what's going on? What's the latest on this? So what's been holding back is that they wanted a complete sample because I also wanted to do a little something tricky with these where you had to really capture, like these people are trapped in a prison of their own psychological design. And so you had to figure out what it was they had put themselves in this prison for and you had to break them of that pattern. And that's how you win this encounter. And so explaining this to Adam and Mark, they were like, I kind of get it, but I'd really like a concrete example. And anytime I sat down to write, I, I got most of the way through or I got like a draft done and it's like this is not the best example of what this could be and so that has been the major slowdown of fulfilling this uh, Kickstarter goal well this week 
last week, I got my Vitruvian hacks from Boss Fight Studios, which are highly articulated. Let's see, hacks actually stands for highly articulated something about action figures. Um, they are each, they, they all have a standard buck, which here we go. So it's like most of them have the same generic body and then they are individualized by their equipment and their, their gear and whatnot. So I happened to get a couple of the blank ones, which have no paint or whatnot. This one is the ghost. So he's translucent green plastic. I put on the bone armor on him and I got an idea uh, that this guy was a ghost who carved the armor out of his own dead body's bones. And I was like, that's pretty cool. And that broke my writer's block unbelievably. I sat down and I wrote over 2,000 words in one night, which is the most I've written in a single session for Millie Narstead. Uh, I was done with it. I was super proud of it. I loved how this concept kind of drove that section, but it didn't overpower what the PCs could do with it. Uh, so I've now got one section done, which is good. Uh, because of how I wrote part one, we, I only needed to do seven sections in total. I said that one of the seven characters actually came loose from the artifact in part one. So you had to go through the seven different stages, four of which are being written by freelancers. I've now given the freelancers this one example as a sample. So now I've only got two sections that I have to worry about. And then part three, which uh, I have a strong grasp of where we're going to go with part three. I'm going to outline it, but I don't want to write that until I get the freelancer sections in because I do want part two to influence the direction of part three. But basically, after you've cleared all of the eight figures that are around this, uh, this, this artifact, it opens up a ninth section in here, and then you go into that ninth section. So that one's going to be on me and two more of these sections. Otherwise, finally, we've got some progress on this, and it is such a relief to be able to say something positive about Million Arstead and the Gnome, uh, the Gnome in Need, because it has ridiculously overdue and I'm sure people have noticed, but uh, I was freelancing fairly regularly before that Kickstarter went up, and I have refused to take on any kicks any freelancing jobs for anybody. Even if Paizo offered me a job, I would be like, I cannot do that until I fulfill this Kickstarter. So trust me, the pressure's been on, and I know we've been a little quiet with updates because, unfortunately, there have been no updates uh, because it's just like I, I could say like had another useless night of no writing. Sorry, guys. No, I had a good night. Uh, Darren Kaldemeyer is often to be the community liaison, by the way, going forward. So he's given, been given access to my like back area where we've been coordinating all this stuff. Uh, things are happening. They've been slowed down a little bit by the PaizoCon seminar coverage. I think people are going to forgive me for uh, slowing down progress to get that stuff out, which has been slower than I wanted to for reasons I'll get into in my, in my next shout out. But uh, I, so one, Million Arstead's back on track, and two, you can thank Vitruvian Hacks, super articulated action figures. They're super awesome. I've got this guy. I've got Stone Fist, who's the guy that was slowly turning to stone when he saw Medusa. So he cut out his own eyeballs. So now he's got just one stone arm and no eyes. And otherwise, he's just this badass Spartan warrior. <laughs> My favorite figure from the set. I've also got at least one Gorgon. So uh, if for nothing else, if not for the love of action figures, get yourself a Vitruvian Hacks at uh, bossfightstudios.com just to thank them for breaking my writer's block and getting you the known need eventually. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to shout out is actually uh, one of our partner's books. Alex Agunas has been working on this book for a while. It's called Childhood Adventures. And it's no secret that him and me both like the concept of like the child adventurer and how that's not something that is, that's, that's something you can build a lot of good stories around. And, and it's something that's not treated very seriously in the genre up until recently. So I've been really excited about the book, and I actually like it a lot now that he's done with it. Uh, it's got art by Jacob Blackman, who we've praised on the show a lot of times before. It uh, it really fulfills the concept. It expands the aging rules. It, it gives lots of options for uh, playing young characters, lots of feats, spells, etc. It's got a mischief section, <laughs> which is kind of a neat way to do things. Uh, but overall... It's a really cool book, so if you're interested in the concept of playing a, a, a your, your Arya, your Robin, your if you want Yen to have more rules, uh, it's a fun book to check out. Uh, but again, it's written by one of our partners, so of course we're completely biased. 100% biased, <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, so It's not like this is a review, this is a plug. Right, I'm not going to review it because it's a partner book. But 
it's cool. I've been waiting for it to come out. I really love all the art in it. Um, go check it out. I like Nohar the Shark's comment of children in peril in space. Oh. <laughs> so my next shout out is really unusual for me and I can guarantee you it's got nothing to do with Pathfinder so if you want to check out now that's cool. But I am giving a shout out to my parents. Uh, one partly because it's Father's Day this weekend and it's my mom's birthday on Saturday so like it's just a good time for it but also uh, my family's been going through some stuff lately and it's been especially hard on the two of them they uh, they are both very um, crea courageous dedicated people who did not have a lot growing up and uh, me and my brothers had a lot of opportunity and it's 100% because my dad worked shifts like a crazy person like in a way that I know I couldn't do which just shows the opportunities he gave me and my brothers and now like I, every now and then I talk about my brothers I do not talk about my family very much on the show I have barely talked about Scarlett and she's 16 months old now and she's wonderful um, but yeah so like one of my brothers is going to med school he's 36 weeks away from getting his his degree one of my brothers is uh, an actuarial accountant and just uh, an absolute math genius uh, Casey is probably the brother I've talked about the most because he's an Irish dancing world champion or like Canadian champion and he's gone to the worlds for Irish dancing and is also uh, he works in the labs at L'Oreal so we have had a lot of opportunities I get to work in creative fields and I get to spend way too much money on GI Joe's because of what my parents did for me and for us and um, over the last couple of years, especially since having Scarlett, I've gotten to see a softer side of my dad, which is really nice because he's always been a reserved person. He's been someone that uh, just because of his upbringing does not open up about too many things. And um, yeah, no, my parents uh, have been going through something that they should not be going through. And it's really been unfortunate and it's been re really hard on them. And it's just kind of made me respect them as people and really made me reconsider just how much they've given to me and to my brothers and anything that I've accomplished and anything that you guys like me for, you owe to them because they, uh, they're just uh, an unbelievable couple of people and they've set the best example for me and Tina as a married couple and as parents. And, uh, yeah, uh, so just like happy birthday to my mom, happy Father's Day to my dad and... Uh, hopefully we get through everything. So, uh, sorry for being a little personal, guys, and for being vague about it on top of it. But uh, that is one of the reasons that I did not get any of the seminar coverage out this week. Uh, we had a really rough weekend. But I expect to get the Saturday seminar coverage out this week. And um, don't, don't worry about telling me that... I don't need to that to deal with my own stuff because this is part of how I deal with my own stuff, guys. Um, the seminar coverage will come out as soon as I can. I'm sorry that you've had to wait for it. I'm glad that I get to get it to you guys. I know you guys are happy with it. I have. I'm happy that I get to do this for you guys too, and that this is something that Paizo didn't say like, no, we don't want you to cover our seminars. This is something that you have to come to Paizo Con for. No, everyone has been super supportive of this and for whatever reason param you and i get a lot of respect out of it so um yeah just kind of uh lost my train of thought at the end there but um don't worry about me guys i'm good the seminars are coming and uh things are good so uh yeah until next time i'm ryan costello and i'm jefferson j thacker also known as param and if you want to find the path, you need no direction. Bye, guys.